We're going to go on a little adventure together. The mind is a sieve through which we filter information relevant to us and our immediate survival. Hence, overlapping realities that do not immediately influence us are secondary concerns. We occasionally get glimpses of these alternate realities in the form of dreams or nightmares. So-called psychedelics have a similar effect. Rather than presenting us with information that is hallucinated, these drugs break down the barriers within our mind that prevent us from perceiving these alternate planes of existence. The problem with both of these approaches, dreams or psychedelics, is that the information brought to the forefront of our minds is chaotic and random. Lucid dreamers have some limited control over the information they perceive, but not everybody is capable of this. Our mind can only parse so much information, and as a result, anything brought in from another reality blends with our own, creating an imprecise picture at best, and a cheap imitation at worst. So I have constructed a ritual which will allow us to both share in a guided tour of a few select alternate realities. The effect is similar to hypnotherapy, in that your willingness to participate will be the chief factor in its effectiveness. We are humans, we have free will, and our minds are more powerful than some might give us credit for. However, that mental strength is also key to our ritual. Mind over matter, an ancient principle, has shown to have at least some scientific backing. Perhaps the best known example of this is the placebo effect, where with some authoritative language and priming, you can be tricked into feeling better, or worse, from a harmless sugar pill. As long as you truly believe, you can make it so. A similar principle is present in religious experiences, where deities are witnessed or heard through a combination of emotional priming, wishful thinking, and that sincere desire to believe. It is trickery, in a sense. I'll admit that right from the get-go. But I can only start the journey. The rest will be up to you to deduce. I cannot see what you will see, nor experience what you will experience. At least, not in the exact same way. As with every other aspect of life, it is up to the individual to parse reality from fiction. And at this point, I should clarify that this ritual is for entertainment purposes only. It is perfectly safe physically, so long as you don't do something stupid like attempted while operating heavy machinery. As for your emotional and mental state, please gauge them accordingly and stop the ritual if you feel uncomfortable, threatened, or perceived by a hostile entity. When you are ready, I want you to either lay down or sit in a comfortable chair. For best effects, I recommend using your headphones, but if you don't have access to these, that is fine. You may be in position for some time, so again, Comfortable rest is essential to the ritual. Our minds perceive this reality first, and you won't want to go exploring other worlds while your joints are screaming at you. On that same note, please only attempt this ritual while you are well. Sneezing, headache, fever, etc. are not only sources of great discomfort when forced to endure them with minimal stimulus, but the ritual may mask your body alerting you to worsening of your symptoms. Are you in position? Headphones on if you have them? Good. We don't need to go through any arcane mumbo jumbo nor gather elusive reagents or chant anything in a foreign tongue. Honestly, your part in the ritual setup is basically done. Now you just need to open your mind. We're going to begin with some simple deep breathing. Breathe. 
Breathe as deep as you can, allowing air to enter your lungs slowly and fully. Ancient cultures had an almost divine respect for air, which many considered one of the core elements of the world. Like water, it is so simple, something we take for granted, but something without which we could not exist. For all our advancement, we have not found anything that could truly replace something so fundamental. Each deep breath is like a prayer to the life-giving elements that sustain us. The deeper we breathe in, the more sincere our appreciation for it. Now, I want you to release the tension in your body. We'll start at the toes and work our way slowly up the body, ending with the mind. Consider our feet the crude but effective devices which bear our weight daily. When was the last time you really stopped to appreciate the work they put in for you? Let them rest. Roll your ankles and let go of the strain on your shins. You're resting now. They can take a break. Move up to your thighs and your hips stretch just slightly at the lower back. You're not properly upright, and you will not need to keep your center of balance to visit the world beyond. Remember to keep breathing slowly as you relax your shoulders and unclench your fists. Almost everything we do directly or indirectly relates to the use of our hands, biological or prosthetic. We are always doing something, always being productive. We place such a premium on that time that we spend doing things. When was the last time you truly sat down and experienced a moment of absolute rest? Even our sleep we clutter with some form of entertainment to satisfy the ever-working mind behind it all. With dreams, our minds work overtime, never truly resting, always functioning, to keep us alive for the scant eighty or so years we are promised. Even now, we cannot fully let it rest, but we can at least offer it a true moment of perfect clarity of thought. If you have not done so already, Close your eyes. Set aside the thoughts of the day. We are not ignoring them or leaving them unfinished, merely putting them on a shelf to be revisited after our ritual. Thoughts of the past, present, and future are immaterial. They are concerns that we invent and we give meaning to, and in a similar vein, we can temporarily remove their meaning. Set them aside. Focus only on the sound of your own breathing. Let your mind enjoy this simple gift of nothingness. A moment of silence now. You may feel a slight drowsiness overcoming you. It is our natural response to setting aside the burdens of the day, much as we do when we lie down to sleep. Embrace that feeling, for it is adjacent to the one we are trying to cultivate. Now think back to the place 
where you felt most safe in your life. A childhood memory, perhaps, or as recent as the very room in which you are performing this ritual. Remember every detail you can. The more complete a picture your mind can conjure, the better for our purposes. Look around the room with your mind. Remember every piece of furniture or every detail of the terrain should it be outdoors. Every minute detail down to the color of the baseboards and species of insect crawling along the ground. Our lives are so generalized that we often overlook the finer details, but you must try to remember everything you can. Now, find the door to this place. It won't be where your door normally would be, and if you are outdoors, it'll be in a place where a door shouldn't be. Picture it now, out of place and vibrant more so than the image you have concocted. Your safe place is a memory, but this door exists in the present. Beautiful craftsmanship, and yet so simple. It is auburn in color, with a silver doorknob that has been polished to a mirror shine. Hold the knob in your hand. The door resists your attempt to open it, but it isn't locked. It is your mind stirring to attempt to maintain its hold on the present. Keep breathing and still yourself. It may take a few moments, but eventually the door will open. Now, through this door is a realm directly parallel to ours, a hallway that extends deep into the bowels of some foreign building on an alien realm. Remember, the beings here cannot touch you. They might not even be aware of your presence yet, if your mind is still enough. Walk down the hallway. The floor is not dissimilar from linoleum, with plain white drywall on either side of you. Open archways divert to the left and right, but you want to remain moving straight. These doorways are distractions, further attempts to lead you astray. You cannot see the ceiling. About thirty feet above you, the walls vanish into a pitch-black void. You don't need to consider this a physical location but a metaphor, and thus only the immediate details were relevant. As you walk, consider the following. You have been here before, a liminal space between consciousness and unconsciousness, a trail we have traveled every night before we begin to dream. Did you know that humans forget about 95% of their dreams immediately upon waking? Our minds don't store this information into long-term memory, an interesting side effect of REM sleep. What is less commonly known is that this is very likely an evolutionary trait to help us distinguish fantasy from reality, or more accurately, our world from theirs. There is the door now at the far end, a simple wooden door not unlike the kind you would find in any mid-sized apartment. Plain pine wood with a silver doorknob. The door should give more readily now, otherwise you might not be in the proper state of mind to proceed. If the door does not open within a few seconds, consider aborting the ritual. If you are still with me, you are likely standing alone in a dark room. On the other side of that door was more of the same, an impossibly high ceiling and walls that extend out slightly before you, but the room has changed. Roughly square proportions from what you can see, and you can make out the far wall, if only just. There is a chair here in the middle of the room, just an ordinary armchair, the kind of thing you might expect in a manor home. 
high-backed with velvety cushions. Take a seat. Feel the luxury, the opulence, and the decadence of such an impractical piece of furniture. As you sit, the room around you begin to gently lift. Despite the twisting of the room, you remain firmly within your seat. It's a steady, forward slope until eventually ceiling and floor are reversed. You stare down into an abyss. Gravity slowly begins to re-exert itself upon your body, but you don't fall exactly. You slowly descend from the chair, gracefully sinking into the void beneath you. There is a world down there, and it is rapidly coming to meet you. This is perhaps the part where I should warn you that I can do little to guide you from here. It'll be up to you to divine your true path. But can't you see that other world forming beneath you? What does it look like? Rushing up to meet you from the void through which you sail. An entire realm previously only experienced in long forgotten nightmares. A chasm spans between you and the true depths of what this reality has in store for you. You land on a surprisingly soft surface, not unlike grass, is it? A vast field that carries on endlessly into a foggy morning. Trees in the distance make themselves known by their looming dark shapes barely visible against the sea of gray. Look around you. Is anything familiar? Don't, don't mind the trees, no. <laughs> Not all of them are truly trees, but you cannot be harmed by them, although they do see you now, and they are very curious to get to know you. Better not to give them a good look at you, you should find shelter. A barn, a farmhouse, anything of the like. What do you see? What's that up ahead? Oh, that building. Yes. Yes, that will do nicely. Go ahead. Run now, but try to keep low to the ground. You there? Wonderful. Peculiar door, I know, but you should have little trouble opening it now. Step inside. More or less what you were expecting, eh? Exactly the kind of foyer you might expect from this building, but slightly off, isn't it? Aren't the colors awfully muted there? Are you unable to get a clear picture? Really look around. Populate the space before you. Familiarize yourself with the layout. Yes. Yes, you have been here before. And you know where the telephone is, don't you? The old rotary phone sits on the same tiny table it always has. Uh, what's that? The cord is cut. Of course it is. You don't need to worry about that. The cord is actually not there at all. Now this is where your mind is warning you that you lack the awareness to make the call you need to get out of here. Did you hear that glass just shatter now? I wonder if some of those not trees have found you after all. Of course, they aren't the only ones who live here. Did you honestly believe that nobody else would be sharing this building with you? Grab the phone and run to the next room, just through the door. Shut it behind you. Yes, there is a window here. No curtains or blinds to shut. Just hide in the corner as far away from it as you can and hope that nobody looks in. That rustling. There's more than one of them. Possibly half a dozen. They're searching for you, and searching for the phone. There's no time to think now. I want you to remember the number. It's the same seven-digit number you can never get out of your head, no matter how many times you try to forget. 
You've dialed it before now, and it will be the first seven-digit number at the tip of your tongue. I keep telling you, it doesn't matter that the cord is gone. Just dial it. Feel the rotary spinning as the internal mechanism chatters away. Terribly long number, isn't it? And such an inefficient way to dial as a phone as you are used to. They're getting closer, and yes, the rotary is getting harder to turn. Normally, it's not a problem you have all night. But normally, you were invited into the house and didn't break in. Ignore that shadow on the wall. Yes, they have found you and are looking right at you through the window. Just keep dialing. Good. I can hear it ringing now, but so can you. The ringing sound calling you back to your own world. Wake up. Open your eyes. This was just the first visitation, and as a result, the effects can be disorienting. I'm sure you are disappointed to have seen so little, but this was a necessary warm-up. Next week's session will be a little more intense. Just keep breathing, and keep an eye on your phone.